This is a story about lions and giraffes and a microscopic little virus. It's also a story about grass and fire and a bunch of these funny looking guys. And what all of that has to do with bombs, extermination, and restoring ancient traditions and extinct ecosystems. There's one big idea that ties all of these together, that even in a place overflowing with life, there's one species that keeps the whole thing from crumbling down. And what happens if we take an ecosystem that's fallen apart and we add that one key species back? Can we fix it? Trace and Emily and myself, we're gonna be bringing you a series of stories, featuring some incredible storytellers, some really passionate scientists, and a bunch of people who just really care about wild places. We're exploring the rules of life that connect ecosystems even half a world apart, like Africa's Serengeti and a Native American tribal community in South Dakota. And while we're at it, we're gonna find out a little more about our place in all of this. Hey. Hi. Trace Dominguez, Emily Grasley, it is so good to see your faces. I am really excited to tell people about this thing, this thing, thing? we've been working on. I don't even know what to call it. Mm. Well, I guess it all it all started with an, an idea uh, that, that there's a different way to tell stories about nature, that maybe we've been doing it all wrong, a way that looks at the bigger picture. Yeah, I feel like when I'm looking at a science story, I tend to get like hyper-focused and you get sort of a narrow lens on what you're looking at and you have a tendency to miss the other stuff that's around you. It's because really everything in nature is connected to so many other bits in nature and often in ways that you don't even expect if you're not looking for it. That's what this is all about. And what we're gonna do is show you how these big ideas, the rules of life, are all connected and how we fit into that. I figure we'd start in the Serengeti. It's an amazing place, but to tell all the stories that happen in that place, I feel like you need to understand why it even exists in the first place. Oh, wow, wow, you just, wow. That is, yes, incredible. That is Jahawi Bertoli. He is this photographer and filmmaker from Kenya. I met up with him out in the Serengeti because he's been going out there his whole life. I mean, just look at the scope of this. It is absolutely incredible. When you think of big drama in a place like the African Serengeti, what's the first thing that pops into your head? Dung beetles. Cheetahs. Those are not the answers I'm looking for. The answer is these guys. What? No, seriously. You are looking at the most important event on the entire Serengeti ecosystem. It's eating grass, Joe. I don't, I don't. Okay, okay, I get it. Wildebeest are kind of goofy. They got that whole goatee thing going on. They have that funny rear end that kind of looks like somebody forgot to finish them. But they might be the reason that the African Serengeti even exists. Um, excuse me, I learned from the documentary Lion King that that is not the case. I don't know how to tell you this, but um, your childhood might have been a lie. Hey. Yeah, have you guys ever seen this pyramid thing? It's kind of a zoomed out way of looking at how ecosystems are organized. So down at the bottom, you've got all the stuff that does photosynthesis, the plants and everything like that. And here in the middle, you've got the stuff that eats the plants. And at the top, you got the stuff that eats the stuff that eats the plants. So everything at the top, that kind of regulates everything underneath it, right? That is what I thought, but that is not how the Serengeti works. Now, the one thing you gotta understand about wildebeest, okay, is just how many of them there are. I mean, wildebeest everywhere. Joe, you went to Africa like one time. Okay, Jahawi helped. So not far from us is a big herd of wildebeest. Is this all of them? Like all of them? Can you imagine? Not even a tiny bit. Every direction that we look is wildebeest, as far as we can see, and also zebra. Just in this little area we are, how many do you think there are? Easily a thousand without turning my head. And then in the distance we see this massive group of zebra, several thousand zebra <laughs> which migrate with them. It looks like the horizon is made of tiny black and white shapes. Thousands and thousands. I mean, it's one of those things that's just 
you can just keep counting. If you took all of the zebras and the giraffes and the antelope and the gazelle, if you took the next 12 most abundant herbivores on the Serengeti, wildebeest would outweigh all of them. How is that possible? That's the big question. That's what scientists wanted to know. How can this place support so many of those funny looking wildebeest? Yeah, I don't understand. Well, I'm gonna tell you, but to do that, we have to go back in time to when the Serengeti was not like this, to the 1950s. So back then, nobody really studied the Serengeti. And scientists were like, you know, maybe the first thing we should do is just count everything. So they started with the wildebeest. In the first year, they counted like 250,000 wildebeest. Then a few years go by, and all of a sudden there's 400,000 wildebeest. You could say that's a lot of new news. Ah. Emily, I love it, new news, because with the G, love it, great. And then just a few years after that, there's 700,000. Fast forward a few more years, there's 1.4 million wildebeest. This is totally weird because based on everything scientists knew up to this point, like large animal populations just don't do this. I mean, sure, like fish, rabbits, plankton, they have these huge rapid population explosions, but giant mammalian herbivores, that just doesn't happen. And actually people started to get worried, like maybe this is too many wildebeest. Sure, the Serengeti is pretty great, but maybe it can't support all of them. But then they realized something. They weren't looking at a population explosion. They were looking at a rebound. Okay, but rebounding from what? Like overhunting or like an ice age extinction? How many viruses have humans completely eradicated from the earth, like in the history of ever? The answer is just two. Smallpox and a virus called rinderpest. Rinderpest was this cattle virus that for like thousands of years caused civilization level plagues and famines by infecting and killing cattle and other ruminants. Now, thanks to massive vaccination efforts, the last reported case was in 2001. But if you go back 100 years before that, rinderpest was accidentally introduced to Africa in the 1890s. And by the 1900s, it had killed like 90% of the wild wildebeest and buffalo in East Africa. A rinderpest vaccine came in the 1950s. And by the 1960s, this virus was basically under control. This virus had been keeping wildebeest populations down for like 70 years. And it wasn't just wildebeest. When they came back, scientists started seeing a whole bunch of other changes in this ecosystem, changes that were pretty surprising. Are there lions in this part? You know, I'm gonna, I wanna see some lions. Okay, yes, there are lions in this part, but we're not done with grass yet. Okay, so one wildebeest doesn't eat that much, but a million and a half wildebeest eat more than nine million pounds of grass every single day. And that's enough to shape a whole ecosystem. You know, wildebeest are quite picky eaters and they basically like short grass. You know, so like now here on the short grass plains, this is perfect for them. But they also like new shoots. That's like, it's like a child. Yeah. My children are already even that picky. The zebra, they're not so picky. So they tend to actually come through first and clear, clear the way. And then, and then the, the wildebeest can get what they want. Wow. Exactly. That's cooperative eating. So if you eliminate this virus, you get more wildebeest. More hungry wildebeest means less grass. And because more grass is being eaten, that means less fuel for fires, and less wildfire means that more young trees get to grow. And more trees growing means more food for giraffes. And elephants, and birds too. And of course, more wildebeest means more food for predators. Hey, now we're at the lion part, right? <laughs> yes, lion numbers went up, and so did hyenas and other predators too. They are the keystone species of this ecosystem. Ding, 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 ding. He said the name of the episode in the episode. It's a six million dollar word. It's incredible to think of enormous groups like this just moving across this yeah. land and eating and, and pooping. I mean, you can imagine the effect on the ecosystem. I've seen the migration, you know, I've been lucky enough to see it quite a few times, but I can't help but be blown away every time by the sheer size and number. There's very few places left that can support these kind of herds. People had always just assumed that a keystone species had to be a predator. But here you've got these funny plant eaters keeping an entire ecosystem from collapsing. And in fact, they're making it better. 
And today, this million and a half wildebeest are the largest herd of plant-eating mammals on Earth. So the population, it's not still growing. I mean, that wouldn't be sustainable, right? No, I mean, you can't have wildebeest growing and like slowly taking over the universe. They remain remarkably stable. And that's the next mystery the scientists had to solve. I mean, why? Oh, Trace, there are definitely lots of lions in this part. I was gonna say, we're top of pyramid. We're getting to the lions, we're getting predators. This is gonna be great. Oh, and hyenas too. Okay, so a lot of stuff gets eaten in the Serengeti by those guys at the top of the pyramid, the predators. But some animals get eaten more than others. Let's say you're something small, like an impala. Well, chances are you're gonna die at the hands of something with fang. I call <laughs> Claws, <laughs> Joe, fangs. claws. The, po the pokey parts. They have what scientists call a high predation rate. But if you're something big, like an elephant or a giraffe, well, not a lot is gonna mess with you. All right, all that makes sense, but where exactly are wildebeest then? Because they're big, but they're not elephants. To answer that, scientists looked at something that uh, Emily knows a thing or two about, bones, dead oh, bones. Oh, dead parts? Oh, dead yeah. animal parts? Well, actually, bone marrow, to be more specific. Sick. So here's the other thing you gotta know about wildebeest. They move, like a lot. In the rainy season, the wildebeest are down in these grassy plains where there's plenty to eat. But as the dry season begins, this sea of wildebeest moves north. This thousand kilometer cycle repeats itself every year. It's one of the greatest animal migrations on Earth. So, you know, when, when a lot of people think about the migration, they, they think wildebeest. Because they call it the, the great, great wildebeest, wildebeest migration. migration. That's, yeah. uh, okay. But in reality, there's a lot of other animals that actually go along for parts of the migration. I mean, you've got Thompson gazelle, you've got a lot of zebra, What's the, what's the, the advantage of, of them traveling with the migration? Well, for your zebra and things, it is about getting to the best grazing. And then you've got safety in numbers, mm -hmm. lots and lots of eyes. The wildebeest migrate, but their predators don't. So that helps them get eaten less. And moving gives wildebeest access to more food than if they stayed in one place. Migration is why this population is so big. But even a place as vast as the Serengeti, it's not infinite. Okay, so when there's plenty to eat, you know, when uh, the rainy season is happening, well, the bone marrow of those wildebeest is nice and fatty. But in the dry season, when there isn't as much to eat, bone marrow gets kind of gross. And when scientists looked at the bones of most dead wildebeest, it was pretty nasty inside. So they think that most wildebeest starve to death. Okay, but some of them do get eaten by lions, hyenas, predators. <laughs> yes, some lions are definitely having lunch. But predators are not what keeps this population from growing. It's how much food there is to eat during the dry season. They aren't regulated from the top down. They're regulated from the bottom up. Scientists call this kind of population limit the carrying capacity. It's basically how much life an ecosystem can support. So the grass is regulating the wildebeest and the wildebeest are regulating everything else. Yeah, and if there's too many wildebeest one year, then more of them starve. And if the numbers get too low, next year there's extra food to go around, the numbers come back up, it's like a boom and bust economy. Exactly, and what is so amazing to me is that this ecosystem is regulating itself. We're gonna be telling a lot more stories from this place. I don't think you can really appreciate the Serengeti without understanding why it exists. And if this species at the middle of everything disappears, if their migration is disrupted by climate change or other human development, well, would this whole place collapse with them? I mean, the Serengeti has rebounded once before, but without the wildebeest, could it do it again? You know, there are so many aspects of this story that remind me of the history of bison in North America. Bison? Bison are like the national mammal, right? Right, yeah, so bison are these Pleistocene giants that have been in North America for over 100,000 years. But as settlers arrived between the 1700s and the 1900s, the U.S. Army sanctioned these huge eradication programs targeting the bison, but also in an effort to eradicate the people here. 
Millions of these bison were slaughtered, many for just their coats or their skulls, and the population went from an estimated 30 to 60 million individuals to just a few hundred in the course of a couple of centuries. That must have had some impact on the ecosystem. Yeah, it's hard to find a comparison. And cows graze too, but bison graze differently. They love grasses and they pass on most of the other shrubs and forbs. So that increases biodiversity by providing food and shelter for all the other animals. They create these huge wallows, and these pits compact soil, so they're creating microhabitats for resilient plants. Bison even impact other soil and plant processes through the ingestion and expulsion of their waste. Love a good poop story. Yeah, good old species feces note for you. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I can totally see where 30 million bison pooping would leave a distinct ecological mark. A skid mark, exactly. if you will. <laughs> right, so anyway, there's a lot of different groups that are trying to reintroduce bison to their historic ranges. But here's the bigger question that I have. Are these restoration efforts more about healing a landscape, an ecosystem, or about healing people? I thought we were talking about the biology and like, you know, animals. Right, I mean, but we don't live in a vacuum, Joe. It's about <laughs> okay. both. Okay, okay, you're right, you're right. So prairies used to be the biggest ecosystems in North America. They covered 170 million acres. That's like 20 times bigger than the Serengeti. That is wow. Right, but by now, prairies have been so heavily cultivated and developed, they're one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. But there happens to be one not far from where I am outside of Chicago. So we are standing in this green field, which is the site of a prairie restoration project. Between the 1930s and 70s, this area looked nothing like this. We went to Medewa National Tallgrass Prairie. Today, it's the only federally protected tallgrass prairie in the United States, but before it was a prairie, it was something else entirely. We are going to see a former ammunition storage bunker. What? What is this doing out here? Well, before Medewin was taken on by the U.S. Forest Service, it was an army property, and it was used during the middle part of the 1900s to manufacture and store military ordnance. They produced them on site, and then they stored them in buildings like this. Whoa! Wow, it is just like a giant cement tube. Yeah. Sounds like a shotgun in there. That's so cool. <laughs> and there used to be like 400 of these bunkers. They stored over a billion pounds of TNT. It was a huge operation. So what happened once they took the bombs and the explosives out of the bunkers, what did they do next? So that is when the real work began. They transferred the land from the army to the US Forest Service in the 90s, but it was pretty polluted and overgrown. So they had to start pulling the invasive species and reintroducing native plants but they were still missing one key element. You talking about bison? Right, I mean, the bison are the real environmental engineers here. They are the prairie's keystone species. Ding, 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 ding. And many of the plants and grasses, the birds and the insects that once called this area home can't return until the bison do too. But it's all part of a big experiment at Medewin, trying to understand these plant and animal interactions. And the, the model organism was not easy to find. So we got word earlier today that the herd of bison is somewhere in the area. Where are the bison? Emily, I was told there would be bison in this episode. We just got a call that someone has spotted them over this ridge. There are bison out there? Yeah, you can see them. They're, they're kind of just below the horizon there with those trees. Oh yeah, I can see them. They're pretty far out there. They are far out. Can you ask them to come a little closer? Uh, I, I could ask them. I, they, they do what they want, though. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Okay, so you take this incredibly polluted place and you get rid of the invasive species, bring back the bison, and you get prairie? I mean, that's part of it. But you have to remember that bison didn't live here in isolation. They lived here alongside people for tens of thousands of years people that relied on the bison for every part of their livelihood, for food and shelter, ceremonial objects, weapons. The removal of bison was a direct assault on the people, the people who played a major role in the ecosystem too. Today, there's a huge effort on part of indigenous nations to reintroduce bison to tribal lands. And one of those groups is the Intertribal Buffalo Council. 
The Inter-Tribal Buffalo Council actually was originated in 1992. A group of people out of Native American Fish and Wildlife Services decided, why are we not doing something to return buffalo to our, to our tribes? That's Arnell Abold. She's the executive director of the ITBC, and talking to her, you really get a sense of how passionately she feels about this project. We look at all of our tribes as individuals, mm -hmm. but together we are a force, you know, to be reckoned with. There's so much heartbeat to it, and there's so much soul to it, you know, and there's just the, that real connection to the buffalo. But, you know, our core has always been returning the buffalo to tribal lands. And in some ways, they're helping with the literal health of their communities. Diabetes is such a big disease on all of our reservations, and buffalo meat, bison meat, is one of the most healthy alternatives you can eat. And that kind of puts it back, you know, back into our hands a little bit, if we can do that. What have been some of your proudest achievements? When we bring new herds onto tribal land, if you can heal the buffalo, the land, and the people, and make that circular connection, imagine the changes that can happen. Maybe they can't happen today, but we're seeing positive changes across Indian country no matter what. Maybe it's just adding three buffalo onto their lands. That's a change, that's positive. That gives that community something to find a little hope in. That is actually super touching. Not only restoring the bison is helping the ecosystem, it's actually helping so many other things as well. Yeah, and you know, it was cool. We were invited to go see the bison on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, but unlike our visit to Midaywin, this, this was really different. <laughs> The Oglala Sioux that manage the herd in Pine Ridge hold a buffalo dance ceremony once a year where they sing, they do dances, and they honor their spiritual connection to the bison. But when they heard that we were coming, they offered to hold a special buffalo ceremony just for us as a way of welcoming our visit to the herd. And it was one of the coolest, most touching things that I've ever been a part of. It's really meaningful because these are our first relatives. When they come out, they're nervous. They look at the ground and they don't know where they're going to, they don't know where they're coming. And they're afraid because they don't know what kind of energy that we carry. Including us in the ceremony was a way of demonstrating that we're bringing good vibes. And then Robert Goodman, the biologist for Oglala Sioux Parks and Recreation, took us out to see the herd. There they are. Yeah. I think I even see like a little baby bison out there. How many bison did you say you had here today? Uh, probably around a thousand. So when you imagine sort of the historic numbers of like, you know, estimates of 30 million buffalo on the landscape, do you have some kind of idea for like the impact those numbers would have had? I don't know, it's hard to wrap your mind around herds that are measured in square miles instead of numbers. Buffalo are kind of known as a keystone species. They really do impact a lot of other animals like the prairie dogs. You know, they graze down the grass and that takes away cover for the predators of the prairie dogs, so they like it. And then the prairie dogs actually, where they've cropped it off, they produce different types of plants that the buffalo like to graze, so it kind of works back and forth. Antelope are known to rely on buffalo too. In the wintertime when it's the snow is really deep, they can't push the snow out and forage as well as the buffalo, so they'll follow right in buffalo's tracks and graze behind them. And you know, just about all of the species that you think of when you think of prairie species are related to the buffalo or rely on the buffalo. Robert told me that the buffalo will distribute seeds of native plants that get caught in their shaggy coats. And even the hoof prints that they leave behind holds water for prairie birds. So it's easy to see that with the removal of bison, everything gets out of whack. I mean, that's amazing to think about, but these are, these are relationships, ecological relationships that have existed for hundreds of thousands of years. I mean, these things have evolved together. They've really um, become to rely on one another in that landscape. You know, at the center of these landscapes, you've got such surprising species. And in a way, the entire ecosystem is resting on their shoulders. So if we remove them or if they die, then these entire ecosystems can come crashing down with them. And what's more, 
if we try to rebuild that, if we try to put it back together, well, we can't do that without this key piece. And I think this teaches us a super important lesson about how we fit into this. So, you know, we talk about this whole Mara Serengeti ecosystem as this wild place, but we have to remember that humans also played a part in creating this ecosystem. So when you kind of look at this system, it's not to look at it as a wildlife and humans in two opposing sides. They are together, you know, and it's, and it's understanding that balance. All of these relationships, all these complex webs that these ecosystems rely on, from the largest animal to the smallest blade of grass, we're not watching that from the outside. We are part of it too. Our species touches this on every level. And we can make a real difference for better or for worse. So yeah, everything is connected by these big ideas, and this isn't the only idea we have to share with you guys. I'm super pumped to get to the other species that we're gonna cover and all the different stories we're gonna put together. This is gonna be so great. The next one is gonna blow your mind. Put down the TikToks for a minute and join us in the next episode of In Our Nature. <laughs>